I stayed there with him for a week. I held his hand tight. Please, John, I prayed. Prayed like I never prayed. You know what I mean? I prayed like I never prayed in my life. Good afternoon. Uh, this is a part three interview with David Duranian. He is a drug and alcohol counselor at American Addiction Institute of Mind and Medicine. Uh, we wanted to share a story today because we think it's educational and very relevant to all of the topics that we discuss on this show. We, on the first two episodes, uh, we've gotten great comments, great reviews about Dave's story. I'm sure it's a little bit of a cliffhanger for everyone to see where we're at. But uh, like I said, he's a drug and alcohol counselor. He spent, uh, I think, about 20 years behind bars. He spent 20 years on lockdown, two years in lockdown. Uh, has a fascinating, fascinating, heart-wrenching story. My name is Dr. B. This is Reality Bites. And we are finishing up our story today about Dave. Uh, hi, Dave. How are you? I'm doing good, Dr. B. Good. Thank you for having me on here again. Great. Um, I don't know if you've had a chance to look at some of the comments we've got. We got a lot of positive feedback, and it was exciting. And it's uh, also empowering to get that kind of feedback to know that you can have the kind of effect that you're having on people out there. So thank you so much for sharing up to this point with us. We've done two interviews so far. I think this is going to be our closing one where we close the story. And I think there's a, a lot of... Uh, this one is very hopeful, and it's very empowering. Uh, it tells us where we are at, brings us up today. Last time we left off at, I think you were in um, isolation. Uh, what, what do they call it, segregated housing it's unit? A, it's, it's called the SHU program. SHU program. And uh, w where were you at? Which prison? I was in uh, Chino, uh, Palm Hall. Okay. And you had just gotten into... Uh, altercation i think it was a broken jaw of some sort Correct. and they put you down for two years in there Correct. uh am i missing anything remind me i didn't look at the last video that we just had uh, remind me where we were uh, it was 19 or it was 2000 it was 2007 and we started 198 we started way before that but you it was about 1987 when you went in huh Correct. so now we're in 2007 you are locked down it's supposed to be for two years um and tell us, take it from there for me. So what we really came down to, uh, I already knew my release date was coming up soon. Um, I was getting out in September of 2007. Uh, I was super excited about getting out, but at the same time, super scared. I didn't know what to expect when I got out, but I was, um, was put in a van that was taken to the, uh, to the city to catch the Greyhound. They basically watch you make sure you're getting on the Greyhound. Let me slow you down. So... Uh, Tell me, the, so at this point, and uh, we talked about it a little bit last time, when you were uh, in the segregated housing unit, was there access to drugs? Uh, no. The, so what, what the, we call it the SHU program. Basically, it's like the hardest of the hard. Um, there's no, no books. There's, the only thing I had was a Bible, which I snuck in. Um, there's, you don't have no celly. Um, basically, they bring the shower to you. Um, you get a letter from your loved ones. They bring a monitor, and you you get to read it over the monitor. Um, uh, whenever they come get you to take you to a doctor or whatever, you're escorted by four COs, and you're shackled, legs all the way up. You look like you're, you've done something horrible. Um, but it was pretty lonely. It was a lonely. Um, I remember meditating a lot. Um, that's what I did, a lot of exercise and to keep my mind occupied. Um, when they did take me to the yard once a week for one hour, I was put in a cage. And in the cage, they have basically like a pull-up bar and they have a dips. That's the only thing you can do is sit in that little cage, like the size, half of this room. And you sit there for an hour and that's it. That's the only thing you get. And then you go back in for one whole week, solid lockdown. I want to pause on this issue. You said a couple of things. Let me ask you this. In a week's period in lockdown... Can you guesstimate for me how many minutes of human physical contact do you think you got? Mm, maybe uh, when they bring the breakfast, lunch, and dinner, maybe like about, because they just open your thing and slide their food in. Um, they, physical contact, so I don't think No, no physical contact. Zero. Correct. Yeah, I, I know there's some uh, interaction, but no physical no contact. No physical. And we talked last time about the letter thing, right? Correct. Uh, you know, a letter has quite a bit of significance and meaning to our 
sort of self, sense mm -hmm. of self, because as you, me and you talked about, and some of the younger folks out there might not really know this because no one writes letters anymore, but you know, if I got a letter from my grandmother or if I got a letter from my mother, that itself really lends itself to an emotional state for me, and it's part of who I am because Correct. that's human contact. And you didn't even have that because you said they would bring a monitor in and you would read your letters. Well, also mine, you have to remember, um, nobody was really writing to me then. Um, when you've been down for a while, people forget about you. And, you know, people's lives move forward. And uh, at that time, me and my girlfriend had a, my first, um, we'd already been split up long before that. Um, there was a lot of uh, back and forth, but people just forget about you. My mother never wrote me. Um, the only time I maybe I'd get a Christmas card, but when I was in the hall, I didn't get no letters from nobody. The only thing I would get is like my release date because they constantly, once a month, they give you the, the paperwork for when your release date's coming up. That's the only thing I got. And I got excited just getting that because it was something, you know, so that's all I get. Can you try to express to me, because I'm very interested in this, because at the end of the day, we're talking about substance abuse and drug addiction. Mm -hmm. And you know how I feel about that. I think it is a symptom of our greater social pathology, which is displayed manifested and expressed so often and it has become so much the common dominant paradigm of how we are living nowadays and 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 the root of that is i think loneliness mm -hmm. and isolation and you don't have to be physically alone necessarily to be lonely and isolated Correct. but in this case you know if you bring in the idea that you are actually physically isolated and alone it's so much more traumatic and it, it's so much more of a burden um, how do you cope during that time in there because i mean prison is one thing which is bad enough as it is but you spent almost two years alone how do you cope you told me someone snuck in a Bible, and you read that several times. Three times. Three times. And when I read the Bible, it was actually there, and I can. I, that's how I coped because when I would read the Bible, I was actually like there was a story about Job. Yeah, uh, Book of and, Job, one of yeah, my favorites. and, and uh, basically, I I could visualize myself there in the mountains, and you know him losing his family, everything happening to him, um, David and Goliath. I could just visualize I was right there, just. That's how I had to be because I didn't know how to get out of that situation. Out of there is no way just to cope. It is what it is. It's right there. You, either a lot of people lose their minds behind there and are never the same. I was fortunate. I was very fortunate um, to be okay. But if you'd see me when I first got out of prison, you would have seen the effect it did do to me. See, I didn't realize what effect it did do to me. It did scar me. I had a lot of anxiety for the next ten years. After that, I, had, I couldn't be in a room full of people. Um, but I didn't recognize it at the time, that how much damage had already done. I'm going to get to that. As a side note, <clears throat> I like the Book of Job so much. Many people don't know this, but on my personal Facebook page, which I barely know how to use, some years back I find a beautiful painting of Job, and, uh, and I put it on my Facebook page, and it's this guy just really broken down, mm -hmm. just kind of looking. No, no one knows that's who that is. So that's my picture on my Facebook page is a picture of Job. So there's so much despair and loneliness. There's so much isolation. You were physically fantasizing through biblical stories. And but it's not just you were, we're not just talking that <clears throat> you were reading these stories. And there were, I'm not talking about this in any sort of moralistic way. But it was a story. It was in front of you. And you were forcing yourself into the narrative mm -hmm. just to escape the physical, psychological, and social isolation. And that Correct. was one of your coping mechanisms. Correct. Last time I asked you if you thought there was any value in that, and you said, yes, I deserved it. And I think we sort of miscommunicated. I think you were wonderful and great at taking accountability and responsibility about uh, regarding the violence that you imposed on another human being and you had this knee-jerk response and then later I think you understood a little bit more. I don't see, <clears throat> and again, uh, this could be a long discussion about individual responsibility and free will uh, and someone taking responsibility for their action. But what we're doing, I think something like this here, I don't see any value in doing this to somebody because uh, it is cruel and unusual punishment and the cost to the individual, 
to the immediate social group that that individual is connected with, and society at large at every level, whether if you could look at the psychosocial cost or the financial cost of resources, I don't see any uh, value in it. And in fact, uh, are, are we talking about punishment? Okay, well, uh, what I see a lot of moral justification for it, it's almost as if there's a categorical God-given imperative to punish, and that's not at all uh, true, and a lot of justification for this kind of response to violence. You committed pretty grotesque violence in prison and got a response for it. I will tell you this, you know, history tells us a lot, and those that don't history are bound to read history are bound to repeat it. Sometimes, some years back, when you look at the prison literature and you read the, you know, the criminal justice philosophical theory of crime and punishment, we realize that the turn of the last century, that isolation has no value in rehabilitation. And, and the data was clear on that and the prison system started to move away from it. And here we are a hundred years later and I think, I could be wrong, I haven't seen this number, and so I think we have 85,000 people down in uh, segregated isolation. Mm -hmm. And I will come back to this in later episodes. I'd like to say something on that, Doug, if I can. I think what's sad, um, what it really comes down to, and I'll make this short and quick, is is people that taxpayers think people go to prison and basically there's some rehabilitation and there is none whatsoever. Uh, it came out worse. You know, um, it's all a lie. It's a big business. Um, it's designed for people to come back. Um, there is nothing positive in there. There's a lot of racist, uh, racial uh, riots going on, and there's reasons behind it. Um, that's constantly um, just fear of whether you're in the hole. Believe it or not, when I was in the hole, I didn't have to watch my back. You know, all those other times, I had to constantly watch my back. You didn't know who was going to get you. That's what it, the reality is. But so the taxpayers don't realize that what they're paying. You know, it's called CDCR, rehabilitation. There's nothing rehabilitating about it. It's just a lie to get the taxpayers to keep going. I couldn't agree with you more. Last time I think I mentioned that this is a form of, it's neo-slavery. Okay? Mm -hmm. That's what it is. And what it is, it, it's neo-slavery. You know, I was watching this thing about North Korea and uh, the work camps, and they sent, uh, uh, you know, citizens abroad, and they put up the work in these work camps abroad, whether, wherever it may be. And, you know, the state makes a lot of money off of this. We are no better. If you look at the per, uh, federal prison system, much more than the state, but both of them, these are basically highly organized, structured workforces, period, end of story. Everything from Victoria's Secret to Starbucks coffee mm -hmm. is making a dime out of this. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> we peddle this nonsense to society and it affects our worldview, our public policy, our healthcare policy in grotesque ways. And there's no evidence behind the things that we are doing, but someone's getting rich off of it. But the long-term cost to you, the individual, but your neighbors around you, I'll tell you what, I don't want a guy moving in next door to me that's been down for five years in, in isolation with my kids around, right? Because you know, I, you know, the impact on that, the literature is extensive. I want to move forward with this. But again, I'm bringing this out because it has a greater part in the narrative that I'm trying to make and, and argue for, which is substance abuse is simply a symptom of a greater pathology of our society, which has, which is rooted in, uh, you know, I believe corporate capitalism. But Let's move forward. So, mm -hmm. I'm sorry, I, I digress. So, you are about to get your release date. How did you feel? I mean, your release date's coming up. You are down. How are you feeling about that? There must be anxiety. You've already mentioned it. Please move forward and on. There is a lot of anxiety, but at that time, I didn't recognize anxiety. Um, never I knew what anxiety even meant. All I know is it was just uh, it was an awkward feeling. I'm excited to get out, but at the same time, it was a beer. Because uh, I've already been pre-planning this for the last six months and nine months. Um, I know what I'm getting. I'm getting $200. I am getting out to nothing. You're actually getting less than that because I think you owe them money. There's restitution and charges mm. like that. Well, they automatically, your gate money, your parole gate money is 200 no matter what. Right. But when you're coming out, you ha uh, I'm sure during the time that you were not in isolation, you were working for a certain amount of money, 
right? No, they don't do, they cut that off um, about 15 years ago before that. They cut off where you make money. You actually work for free. Okay, so you're working for free, but there's also all these charges that you were charged for the trial, Correct. for restitution, all these things. Any of your family members send you money, they have to, um, they keep 55% of it. Okay, so you've been down now for like 18, 19 years. You are, you haven't contributed to Social Security. You have done nothing in terms of educational growth, professional growth, Correct. labor growth. You have been disconnected from your family extensively. Mm -hmm. Correct. You're just basically a human being caged in a box. Uh, warehoused. Warehouse. You're warehoused. And then you're going out and you're getting 200 bucks. Correct. That's it. So, you know, how far is $200 going to go in 2007? Um, they've been given $200 for the last 40 years. It's never changed. $200 $200. Now, 40 years ago, $200 went a little bit, went a little bit longer, but um yeah we'll get more into that what i did with the 200 dollars. tell me about the day can we can we start from sure. the, day, uh, the day that i was getting released um basically they they came to my cell um they shot i was shackled they shackled me up they took me downstairs um where they have like a, a holding cell they put me in there I'd wait about three hours and I'm, I'm anxious to get out i mean i'm just like so excited i'm in a cage i'm like an animal I'm getting ready to get out i'm excited they bring me um what it's called is like some, like, it's a kind of like a cheap pair of pants and a cheap shirt, you know, kind of like a donation thing that they get from um, the inmates make. And I had to pay for that out of the $200. It was like $39 with some shoes that were like, they were Bob Barker shoes. And uh, basically put me in that and then had me go to another cage, another two hours waiting there. And they came over and got my fingerprint basically a fingerprint that I was getting released, gave me my paperwork, who my pro officer was, what city, which was at the time was Santa Fe Springs. Uh, That's LA area? Correct. And I had to report within 24 hours. Uh, I was on high control. Um, so they basically put me on this uh, little van. They put me in the little van. What was that like getting out, just even in a parking overwhelming. lot Overwhelming. It, it was exciting, but yeah. it was overwhelming. Um, it was like... I started getting a headache because I was so excited. It was just too much. It was a lot at that time. Yeah, it was, huh? Yeah, yeah. It was overwhelming. It was overwhelming. But it was nice just knowing I was not going to have to be a part of that no more. The politics and none of the other stuff no more. I wasn't going to have to be involved in none of that no more. Did you have a... So they put you in a van. Go, go on. Well, I mean, did you know where you were going, what the plan was for you in the next week or something? Is oh, anybody no. expecting no you to come home? No, no. There was no plan. There was no plan, then you know what I mean? But there was none, none. There was no, not one plan. The only plan I had was that day, um, I was gonna go get a, a motel and go check in my pro, pro officer the next day. Uh, pro officers in LA, you're in Central California. That's a, at least 100 miles, right? Uh, well, Chino is over there um, more like by uh, Chino, California. Uh -huh. And that's where I'm at. So they, they take me to LA, downtown LA. Which, you know what downtown LA mm -hmm. looks like. I mean, it's a lot of people. Um, but when they put me in the van, they stopped and they dropped me off at the uh, Greyhound station, which is like a little mini Greyhound station. In Chino? Yes. Okay. And I bought me a pack of cigarettes, which was like $8. And I was like, geez, you know, I mean, here it goes. My money's already disappearing. And I have to pay for my Greyhound ticket. Oh, they didn't even pay for that. Nah, nah that's part of your two hundred dollars. They pay just for. said you got to be in LA and you got to report tomorrow. Yeah, exactly. And you have nowhere to go. You have the clothes on your back. Uh, the only thing you know in this world is you have the two hundred dollars. You got to get to Los Angeles. Well, I'm down to one hundred and twenty to one hundred and fifteen now already, okay. after buying a, a pack of cigarettes and, and a Greyhound, Greyhound ticket and the, the clothes. Oh, you have to pay for the clothes? Yeah, you have to pay for the clothes. So they, they, you pay for the clothes in there as well? Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yep. Uh, yeah, slow, Nothing's free. Please slow down because these details are very well, important to me. I don't uh, want to be like, like, so nothing is free, Dr. B. So you have to understand once you go through there, nothing is free. Anytime you had a medical problem, they automatically charge you $5, even if it was just aspirin. Nothing is free. Everything's automatically, whatever it is, you're paying for it. I apologize. Yeah, the clothes was it was cheap clothes, but I had to pay money for that too. So now you're in Chino at the Greyhound station. Mm -hmm. did, did you eat? Mm. Bought me a bag of chips. 
I had too much too much anxiety going on. I felt nauseous. I didn't want to eat too much. Um, you heard a lot of stories. If you start, if you eat like a hamburger or something, you're going to get sick because it's the food is different. You know, you're eating actually real food. When you're in jail, prison, they give you the bare minimum nutrients. And, you know, there's nothing heavy about it. It's just bare minimum to survive. So when you get out, you got to be careful what you eat. They always teach you this because it is, a lot of people get real sick. It's too rich for you. You never ate good food in a long time. Hmm. No. Were you thinking about meth or heroin when you got out? No, no, not really. Because you know, I really wanted to be sober. I really, I didn't want to live this lifestyle no more. I didn't. I was tired. I was so tired. you already had that in your mind. Correct. Let me t ask you this: If I was being released, I would look at the recidivism, and I would be like, "Hmm, it's sixty percent, seventy percent, eighty percent. What are my chances?" Did any of those thoughts go through your mind that, "Hey, I'm going to get"? ship back here the system no. set up for me to no fail. not really no nah, it was basically how am i going to survive today that's the way my ammo has always been i've been accustomed to that how am i going to survive today how am i going to make it today how am i going to find somewhere to sleep tonight that was my main goal it's always been like that since i was a young kid so when i went to prison i didn't have to worry about that no more now we're back at this again where i have to figure out where am i going to stay tonight you know so my game plan was just basically get a room uh, go see the pro officer the next day and just hope something good happens out of it. Okay, okay. so let's go to downtown LA. You got the bus. How was the bus ride? Bus ride was nice. It was okay. Um, uh, the Greyhound wasn't too bad. Um, they picked up some more uh, convicts somewhere else um, you know, from Norco, and we basically we came down towards downtown LA. I just kind of sat by the window, just was admiring the views, driving on the freeway. I haven't been on the freeway in a while. Because um, when you go in a CDC bus, basically have your shackle with the windows are covered. Black top, huh? You don't see nothing. So it was nice to be able to see the view of like the mountains and stuff like that. And it was just different. I appreciated that. I did. You know, especially in Chino, I'd see cows and stuff. I, I liked it. It was kind of nice. Cool. So you got downtown LA, and what'd you do there? That's when everything changed. Um, the minute I got downtown LA, it was too uh, crowded, it was too many people. The buildings were too big for me. Um, the cars were just changed too much. People had cell phones. Um, uh, the, I think the hardest part was this uh, lady was uh, walking towards me and she was talking to me. And um, I'm like, what? And she goes, she just kept talking. And I thought, she's talking to me. She was looking directly at me and she was talking to me. And it was one of those earpieces. And I didn't know this at the time. And I just freaked out. You know, I thought, she goes, I'm talking on the phone. I was like, oh my God. I started getting, I was like, this is too much, and everybody's just a lot of people, just commotion. I was just starting to sweat profusely. I had long hair, too, at the time. Mustache, my beard, and everything was just heavy. Because when I got out, I had, um, from the hole, I couldn't shave, so I looked like Jesus. You couldn't shave in there? You could. They give you a razor, and you, you have to use it within, like, a, a minute and a half and return it back because they're worried that someone might kill themselves. But I, I, I don't have a minute and a half to shave, you know, so I just let it grow. But I started sweating profusely. I mean, it was it was hard. Um, I feel like I'm sweating right now just going back to that time. It's hard for me to talk about that time because um, I couldn't breathe. I couldn't breathe. And so my first thought was I went back to my survival skill where it was I need a drink. Wasn't even planning on this to get in a drink. So I went down the street where there was a liquor store. First day out, huh? Mm -hmm. yeah. First, I, it, You know what? I'm glad I found that drink. I don't want you know sound however sound. That's okay. I just yeah. I want to know how I want, I want you to share with. I you. just the minute I put that drink in, I was like, whew, I felt relieved. Okay, a little bit relieved, not fully relieved, but I felt relieved. I could not breathe. I was like, I like my breath was sucked in. It was just too much. It's fascinating because you know alcohol is a sedative, hypnotic. Okay, it, it calms you down. It's no different than benzodiazepines, and the very system that was supposed to punish, rehabilitate. That's a long discussion. The first day it set you out, it actually kicked in a fight or flight mechanism that you needed to sedate yourself mm -hmm. and took you back to the thing that actually would get you. It's Do you, mm -hmm. do you see the irony Correct. in all of that? It's fascinating, isn't it? Yeah, it is fascinating. It's tragic, but it's fascinating, and I, these are the things I want to really draw out. Well, the alcohol probably saved me for the moment. For the moment, yeah. And that's sure. what it was. It was for the moment. So, and you know, I basically, I jumped on the bus and I bought another bottle, um, just a small little, um, couple airplane bottles. Um, I took, I drank them on the, the bus and went to, uh, towards Norwalk. 
uh, the Greyhound station over there. Hard Rock is where you're from. Correct. And uh, got out there and basically checked into a, a Motel 6 in on Rosecrans Boulevard and checked in there. I already finished my airplane bottles off. It was probably like 6, 7 p.m. Um, went and bought me a, a couple of tacos from Del Taco and uh, bought me a big bottle of alcohol. Wow. And uh, sat in the room. This is 24 time. hours after release. Correct. Yeah, sat in that room, drank. Did you call anybody? No, I didn't call anybody. Didn't call nobody. I, I didn't want to call nobody. I just wanted to be isolated by myself. That's what I was used to. I was. I, I needed to be. I, it just was too much right there at that moment for me. There's something profound about that, and something cruel, tragic. I, I don't know what the word is. The system decided to take on the responsibility to punish you or for the crimes you have done. And I'm not justifying anything you've done. There has to be a consequence. They housed you for this many years and just... Pff. What would you expect them to do? Because, I, well, what would I expect them to do? I expect a much better social system mm -hmm. that actually uses rational thought and critical thinking and truly humane approach to dealing with our brothers and sisters. I agree with you, Dr. B, but that, the reality, that's what I 100% I, I agree with you, but the reality is they don't care. I know. You know, they want you to, they want you to come back. You're making money. You know, when later on I found out how much money they make per year on an inmate, mm -hmm. it's, it's California's a big business when it comes to CDC. The whole country is now, actually. Yeah, um, yeah that's what I expect. Uh, you see this the world over, the prison systems, mm -hmm. uh, how the, you know, everybody, I don't know, maybe we were a very violent, uncaring, inhumane society and we lie to ourselves about that. I don't know. But, uh, okay, so you bought a big bottle. What'd you buy? Vodka? I bought a big bottle of vodka. Were you worried about, so of that money that you had, you felt the most important thing to do at that time was use that by, by it yourself. It didn't matter. It was just taking care of me at that moment. I just wanted to feel what I was feeling. Felt pretty good. I was relaxed, drinking the vodka. Um, you know, I just drank the vodka until about maybe eleven o'clock, and I fell asleep. I fell asleep, and uh, it was nice. But it was, I actually slept good that night. You know, it wasn't like you know getting up early in the morning for breakfast and all that. And it was it was dark in there. See, I was in the last two years in the. Um, shoot program the lights are always on like this like bright even when you're asleep they keep it on because when they pass by you they sell they can look in your window and then make sure you're still there you can escape you know so I, I have no lights on wow i appreciate that i get to sleep in the dark and not in a nice bed not a hard bed like this you know i get to sleep in a, in a good and i have my own toilet and I, my toilet's not next to my bed it's in a bathroom a bathroom, you know, you appreciate things. These are things I was already appreciating. If I had money, I'd live in the motel and be okay with that. But I didn't have no money. I didn't have no money. What was you know? What was my my next option? The only, my only option I can do is go to my professor and just see what happens. You know, but that time it was just like this is my only option I have. You know, I could have went back to doing crime, but I can't live this life no more. That's something inside of me already knew. I can't do this lifestyle no more. This isn't working no more. You know, basically, I already have three strikes. I'm washed up. If I if I commit any crime, I'm getting 25 life. So I'm not going to go down that route. Okay. So did you make it in the morning? I did. I I showed up to my professors. I showed up to my professors, and uh, basically, there was four new guys that were there to meet her too. It was called orientation, and she had us all lined up. And the first guy, she said, "Are you high?" And he goes, "Yeah." She goes, "Next guy." You high? She's asking if they're high on drugs, not alcohol. And she gets to me and she goes, "You high?" And I go, "No." She goes, "You've been drinking?" I go, "All night long." You know. And uh, she goes, "You're gonna go to a program?" I was like, "I am." And uh, she said, "Yeah." I said, "No, I'm not." And uh, she said, "Well, then you're gonna get violated." So I told her, "You know, you can't just violate me for no reason. It's not on my stipulations. I can't drink. You're allowed to drink." And so she let me go. Um, two days later, I was calling her about the program because I, I did need to get some help. I was Where did you go? What were you planning to do when you left? I didn't have no plans, Dr. B. There's no plans. There was no plans. 
you know, you're talking to a, um, somebody that has no coping skills, no ideals, no bright ideals. I'm out of bright ideals. I have no plans. I can't commit crime, so I'm sleeping in the park for the next two days. I have enough, barely enough money to get some alcohol. That's it. But if even that ran out on the second day. I had no alcohol either. So I, I called the probation officer at the, uh, the payphone. I was like, the program sounds about pretty good right now. And so she told me to come to her office right on the, as soon as possible. And so I did. And I went into over her office, waited. She made me wait for a couple hours, and she came out, and she says, you're going to be going to San Pedro, which is in Los Angeles, California, um, a place called Fred Brown's. It's for people coming out of prisons, you know, that adapt to it, do long prison terms, can adjust to it. Uh, there was a guy that came picked me up, which he was just like me. He was an ex-con, um, African American guy. He was an awesome guy. He picked me up in the car and he was made me feel real comfortable because I had a lot of anxiety. He knew that, and uh, took me to San Pedro. And uh, I rolled up over there and uh, seen this. Said this is where we're at, and uh, checked me in. We searched through uh, my little bit of belongings I had. You know, I came out with like letters and stuff, parole letters and stuff like that. Just basic stuff and introduced me to everybody. And I got to meet a, a lady that was going to be my counselor. She was a drug addict. She'd been sober at the time for like 30 years. Uh, she, she really made a, an impact on my life. Uh, her name was Diane Chavez. She made a big impact on my life because uh, she lost a lot of family members, her husbands, to overdose. But she cared about me. You know, we go back to when I was in school, she actually cared about me. I could tell she cared about me. Um, I remember sitting there and this black guy was smoking a cigarette and he goes, you want some? And I go, I don't smoke after black people. This is where my mindset is at, you know? And uh, it's kind of sad when I look back at it because uh, it really wasn't like that when I was a kid, but being in prison all those years has set me up to where I can't, I can't smoke after other races. But uh, eventually I kept doing these groups and going to outside meetings and, um, it was really hard for me. It was really hard for me. Um, it seemed like I was scared of the girls. The girls scared me. You know, they had a few treatment centers out there, and I felt like they were staring at me. Uh, it was real tough for me, and I sweated all the time. I, I constantly, every day I was sweating because a lot of anxiety. I still had long hair, and my counselor, Diane, was like, why don't you get your hair cut? You'll be a productive member of society. And I was like, what? She goes, yeah, why don't you get a haircut? Uh, she took me down to get a haircut. I got my hair cut and then came back, and I was there for a long time. I was there for maybe about seven months, and go ahead. No, go ahead. Was it state-funded? Yes, it was. It was called SASCA, okay. which was a great funding program because it gave me an opportunity to have a timeout before I go out there and commit crime. I'm glad you said you mentioned that because that was the best funding they had. In 2000, it was called SASCA, SAP program, from 2005 to 2000 nine and they took the program away so i was actually surprised there's such a wonderful program and then uh the outcome that i expect of such things you, mm -hmm. you told me it's gone yeah because uh, that's exactly the kind i know of why thing. you're smiling because you know it's true i yeah. mean yeah that's reality i mean they had that was the best program they ever had the success a lot of my friends were that did a lot of prison time came through there are successful today they, they, they are, I'm shocked. If it wasn't for that program, I wouldn't be out today either. I was, I was wondering about all of that as you were speaking. I'm like, wow, uh, there was a lifeline. Uh, what is this program? Because I'd like to know where it is and send, you know, to refer other people to it. And then it's gone. The punchline, it's gone. I don't ask it. They call it AB 109, which is through probation. Yeah, it's no good. Um, okay, so you spent uh, nine months there. Tell us what you. Uh, did you continue to drink or did drinking no, stop? No, I, I stayed sober. I, you can't drink there. You weren't allowed to drink. They breathalyzed you. They UA'd you. Uh, your officer came there to visit you. Um, they tested you three times. Remember, this program is part of CDC prison. It's actually funded under CDC in the state. And so the CDC would come check up on you, make sure that the program is going by their guidelines, what they expect. Um, but I, I liked the program because it wasn't... It was like a step to getting out to the streets. I was still like institutionalized. I was still there. Um, I was going to the outside meetings. I would go with all the guys that would go to the outside meeting. We had to go together. And um, at that time, um, you know, I was going to meetings and they said you had to get a sponsor. 
and uh, I picked a sponsor and you know he wanted me to do steps and I really didn't want to do steps but I didn't tell him that I didn't want it I really didn't want to do nothing I just I was there I was existing and then um, I met somebody I met uh, I met my wife my girlfriend at the time in that program she was in the house she was in a program down the street oh the I see okay go on yeah and uh, she was an awesome person. This is 2007, eight? 2000, it was at 2007 and 2008. It was like right on Christmas and New Year's and uh, I did meet her. I was always looking at her, but girls scared me, but she didn't scare me uh, because she, was, she wasn't like um, pressuring me. It wasn't pressure. She was just real nice. Um, we got to know each other a little bit, but we weren't allowed to talk to each other, but we were sneaky doing it, you know, behind everybody's backs and stuff. and. I, I get emotional when I think about it because uh, she took me to her house and I get to meet her mom. Uh, I got to meet her mom and, you know, I always told you I wanted a family, you mm -hmm. know what I mean? And uh, I never felt like I'd had a family. And, uh, yeah, so it was, it's tough. It was tough. Her mom's a sweetheart. You know, her mom treated me like a, a, a human being. Her mom was from Germany, was in the... Um, she was German, but she was put in an orphanage in World War II. And, but she treated me like gold, Dr. B. Um, yeah. She always fed me and stuff. She didn't encourage me. She nurtured me. You know what I mean? And uh, for that, uh, forever, I, I love that lady. I do. I get emotional when I think about that part. There's a lot more to it when it comes with her. You know, um, but my wife was, um, I envied her at first because... You know, she had a family. You know, I told you, I kind of used to get jealous. People had families. Yeah, I remember. But the difference was my girlfriend made me part of the family. You know, she made me a part of the family, which I wasn't used to. But I'm still got some behaviors. I'm still got some unresolved issues, like we talked about earlier. And I'm still in the program. Um, I'm now I'm in the, it's like a halfway house where you don't have to do treatment no more. You're basically like phase two. Um, it's a, you're living in a, like a sober living house. And so I never worked. I worked only at McDonald's, Del Taco, but I haven't worked in like a legitimate job in years. So I started getting bright ideas because I would take the bus to go see my pro officer. Um, I seen these, uh, the, you know, the, the Mexican people out there in Home Depot with the signs and they're working. Well, I got a bright idea, why don't I do that? So I went to Home Depot and that's how I started working, doing side jobs. Making like 100 to 150 bucks a day, save that money up. Eventually, I uh, I moved to Lamita and rented a garage from another Armenian guy, and uh, rent me the garage, and I was living in the garage. And you're dating your current wife by this time. Correct, correct. It's kind of industrious and ingenious of you to see something as you're driving by and say, "Hey, I'm going to do that," and you go out there and you actually hustled and made some money. Well, you got to remember Easter basket. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? Come on. You're, you're not, I'm not no, I know how to hustle. You know, I, I but I, I also, my ego is not that big. I can work hard just like them too. They're great workers. Yeah, know? no, 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 yeah. And you know what I mean? It's um, a great way, yeah. I'm, what's the difference with them? I mean, nothing. You know, I can work too hard. I like work and I have great work ethics. So basically, I'm living in that garage and I work in, I got a permanent job now is uh, doing tile work. I do beautiful Spanish tile over down the beach, and uh, I'm working with this guy, and um, I start drinking. Before the drinking, was it very liberating to have your own place, even though it was a garage? I mean, that must have felt great. Yeah, it was. It was. Um, but the heartbreaking part was uh, I, I had a lot of insecurities, a lot of stuff, and my girlfriend at the time was really working on her steps. I wasn't. And uh, she, she was trying to get her son back. That's how she ended up in the program. She was trying to get her son back. She lost her son when he was three years old and, and was about to give up for adoption. But I was like, I was always over her, like letting, letting her breathe. You know what I mean? I was just like this insecure guy, very insecure, always like, like calling her. And if she didn't answer the phone, then she doesn't love me. That's where I'm at this time. You know, very, like, like a lot of court issues going on. I didn't recognize that then. She told me one day, she was like, I need to work on myself. You know what I mean? Well, what I heard is we're breaking up. 
That's what I heard. And I sat on the corner. This is a convict guy. I sat on the corner and I cried. Literally cried. You know, um, from that point on, I kind of just left her alone. She would come visit me. She was awesome. Like I said, nothing changed. She was an awesome girl. But I wanted, to, I needed to be validated. I needed to know that she loved me. You know, I was so used to my exes basically accusing me of cheating on them, all that. Well, this one wasn't like that. I thought, man, she doesn't want to fight with me. I'm used to fighting. That's got to be chaos. I grew up in this chaos. I'm expecting to be like this, and it's not. And I'm, this is weird. This is different for me. Um, I'm living in the garage. Uh, she comes visits me every once in a while, and uh, I'm drinking. Now I'm drinking. I'm drinking pretty heavy, and uh, she doesn't know this. She comes over, and my little brother came to visit me from Oregon, Gregory, and there's probably a, maybe good hundred beer cans outside on the back of the garage and she comes over and she goes what's all these beer cans and I blame it on my brother you know what I mean I blamed it all on him it was me um, but I started drinking at nine months when I was you know nine months sober at the time uh, I didn't want her to know it because she was very serious about her recovery I didn't want to lose her that I'm real selfish I, that's what it really comes down to I don't want to lose her because she's the best thing that's ever happened to me I continue to do the tile work and you know, my alcoholism got really bad. Something happened, was, was kind of odd. The, the job, the tile job that we did was already running to end. My buddy Dave lost his visa, he was from Australia. Uh, he was getting deported. Um, I was losing the garage because I had no more money. It's pretty much, I was done. You weren't saving money this nine months? I didn't know how to budget money, Dr. Yeah. B. Yeah. You, my, my girlfriend would come over I'd, I'd spoil the heck out of her. And then I also was, um, I would get her son one day a week. She would bring me her son while she had to go to work. And I would spend a lot, take the kid to the game stop. And, uh, I got to be a kid with him, you know, because I never got to be a kid. Yeah. I got to be a kid. His name was Jonathan. And uh, yeah, I got to be a kid with him and, you know, take him by Army Man, Legos. You know, he'd been through a lot before that. He'd been through a lot himself. That's why he was in the foster home. Um, he'd been through a lot of abuse, not from the mom, but just neglect from the mom, but abuse from the, um, the, the dad. So we and him spent a lot of time close bond, you know what I mean? I mean, anybody can make a kid, but can you raise a kid? Yeah, I, I, believe me, I know. Yeah. Um, <coughs> so it seems like through all of this, you were doing things that were therapeutic for you, mm -hmm. but at the same time... Uh, on your own, without too much guidance, it seems like, I, I don't know, maybe it's now that you're on retrospect, you're telling me, but you were also learning a lot yourself of all the tools that you didn't have. Because you nail it as you tell me. You're like, well, I didn't have management, to, money management skills. Mm -hmm. Here's a child. I wanted him to, uh, I could now be a kid again for the first time. I had a roof over, under, over my head. I mm -hmm. had a job. So I see a lot, of, a lot of that. Is that on retrospect, or were you kind of self-aware of all of these changes? No, at that time, time I wasn't self-aware. Okay. I do a lot of reflecting. Mind you, I made $1,000 a week. That was a lot of money in 2007, 2008. That's a lot of money. For a single guy, I should have been able to... I mean, I'm taking my wife to... We're going eating $200 meals, and, you know, we had some... And the beautiful part is we had great experiences. We had really great experiences. I'm taking the kid to go-kart world. You know, I'm doing everything, you know, um, spending a lot of money. And when she would go home, I'd go to these bars and I'd buy alcohol, you know, and it's expensive. Why'd you start the drinking again, do you think? I had a lot of unresolved issues still. Yeah. See, I'm always busy helping everybody else, but David's never taken care of David, you know, the inside. I'm never taking care of me, my insecurities, the low self-esteem. I'm never taking care of not even even scratched the surface, you know, never, just never. And the thing is, is also, it didn't, I've never even heard of therapy before that. I've never even heard of therapy. Um, I didn't work on nothing on me. Everything was about the outside. It's all the outside. It was, inside was like crap. It was still crap. You know, still scared for my life. I was still on parole. I'm still on parole. I'm checking in with the, I'm checking in with the parole. And that's a miracle too, because I never checked in with the parole. I'm checking in with the parole once a month. They're happy, you know. Um... But let's get back to the part where I lost my job because the contract was up. Um, I'm getting ready to lose the garage. In my mind, she, my girlfriend doesn't know this. My alcoholism bad. Um, one day I go get so drunk on uh, four locals. 
Um, I, I drank the two of them, and uh, I remember I took a, a Xanax, and I never took a Xanax before in my life. Somebody had me on Xanax, and I passed out. And I passed out, and, and, and I don't know how I got to the garage, but I did. Uh, I woke up, and something told me that something had to change. Um, Mind you, um, I would go back to Fred Brown's once in a while and visit a couple of my buddies that were there. I became close with these guys. My wife, had, his girlfriend at the time, had just gotten an accident. It wasn't her fault, so they gave her a rental car. She comes, picks me up one day, and she knows this is it for me, the garage. So we go visit. She goes to her, her home group meeting, House of Hope, which is down the street from Fred Brown's. So I drop her off. She lets me drive. I go to Fred Brown's and my best friend, one of my best friends, Kenny's there. He works there. I go, dude, I'm about to be homeless. And he goes, you want a house manager job? I go, what? He goes, yeah, I'll get you a house manager job right now. Um, that same day, got me a house manager job. It's like a god shot for me. Yeah. Yeah. It was just too much of a coincidence. It was like, it's like dude, I don't express what's going on with me. But inside, it's, it's like, a, it's, it's, it's hard. It's hard. You know, people don't understand that. It's just like... Inside, I'm not going to tell you what I'm really feeling, Dr. B, at that time. But inside, I'm through the war. I'm like scared. Ah, I'm scared. I'm going to be homeless again. But Kenny helped me get into a house manager position. From that point on, I didn't drink. Really? Yeah. Just went cold turkey. And you I stopped. went cold turkey because I... <clears throat> uh, it kind of was a godsend in so many ways, right? Not correct. The physical roof over your Well, the depression like kicked in. That's when depression really kicked in bad, too. Depression kicked in because I was all alone in that garage. See, my girlfriend was living with her mom, and, and her son was living still in the foster home. They would, she would get a few days a week. Well, her son was finally coming home. I don't want to get in the way of her and her son. I, you got to remember something. My mom's boyfriend got in the way of me and my mom. Right. I don't want, to, I don't want that ever happen to nobody. Your child, your child. Please don't put me in front of your child. The child comes first, okay, because I know what that feels like. But even though I, I, I made that decision that her child should come first, I was so alone in that garage. You know, and, and then I drank and I and the Xanax and it was a very dark place. It was a very dark place. So when I went to back to be a house manager, I was super grateful. I didn't forget that dark place. It was depressing. I, I contemplated suicide. I still was contemplating suicide. After all these years, I'm still thinking about suicide. Um, so I met Fred Brown, so I'm a manager there now. Just a manager, basic, you know, whatever you want to call it. I just make sure they put me on the, I went and got my driver's license, by the way, for the first time, which was a big deal. I went and got my driver's license and uh, they put me on the insurance and my job was to take the clients to the, pro, to the uh, pro office. So I did this, I would take the clients to the pro office. One thing is that um, while I'm working there, I realized my core gift was I didn't know how to build a report with people, especially with people with mental illness and people with uh, been through a lot like I've been through. And uh, my uh, friend came up to me and says, why don't you think about going to school to become a drug and alcohol counselor? I don't believe this. See, I don't think I know I can't do it. She just doesn't understand. She doesn't know who I am. But she sees something in me that I didn't see in me. And at that time, you at the moment... Or just previously to that, you didn't have any plans for furthering yourself, whether it's mm -mm. educational, professional development. I could never do it. No way. I'm stupid. That's how I perceive myself. No, I'm you just, you just don't know it. I just put it front up like, yeah, yeah, I know what you're talking about. I don't know what you're talking about. I don't believe in myself. I don't believe in myself one bit at all. You know, my girlfriend used to give me more, more hope than I gave myself. Her mom gave me more hope. People gave me more hope. If I'd have met you, you would have given me more hope, but I didn't believe you. I didn't believe what you guys were saying to me. You know, I didn't believe. I was incapable of doing it. So they kept pushing me to, you know, maybe I should do some education. And that's when I went and got my, um, the last of my credits, I got a high school diploma. Okay. So I did do that. Um, I'm there maybe for like, now I've been there for like a year and a half, and my girlfriend's starting to come around more now. So I get, I get taxes one year, and I get her an apartment down the street, right down the street from the treatment center where I'm at. I get her an apartment. Um, it's a two-bedroom apartment. Um, wait, is it? No, it's a one-bedroom apartment, and it's beautiful right across the street from Portugal. I'm maybe a block and a half from uh, her. Do you know that I could not even move in with her? I'm still institutionalized. I'm huh. in fear. 
and I'm used to being in, in the institutionalized. But her and I got a lot closer together. We got a lot closer, but I still didn't understand relationships. Um, I continued to work at, at Fred Brown's. Um, a problem I had was I had no boundaries. People asked me to do this, do that, and I, I, I would work like 18, 20 hours straight. Um, I did this for a long time. I got more closer to her family. I would take vacations. They'd take me to like, to Vegas, um, Laughlin, Ray Runner. I've never done none of this. Remember, they went camping without me, Dr. B. You know what yeah, I mean? When you were 10 years old. Yeah, they went camping without me. Yeah, I remember. They yeah. went motorcycle riding. Well, her family didn't leave me. They took me. You know what I mean? And I was not used to a family like that. Um, I continued to, uh, once in a while, I would drink when no one was looking. I would drink a tall can, and I would. I would and uh, no one knew. And... Uh, I feel bad about that when I think about that because uh, I took a lot of bogus chips. You know? And it wasn't that I wanted to go up there and get a chip. It's because my girlfriend was like, you need to show them that you're sober. I'm like, if she only knew. You know what I mean? So I would do it because she's like punking me up there to get a, a chip. Um, still didn't want to work on myself, but I want to help everybody else. I don't want to work on me. Just like society wants to look at you, but not me. Um, I continue to do the, live, go down this path. Um, I am going to school now, um, in a school in Lakewood to become a drug and alcohol counselor. Um, so you started that in, around what year is this? 2010, 11? That was like about 2009, 2010. Yeah. Yeah. It was like right then. Um, I actually liked the school a lot because the school is like making me look at myself. And my breaking point was when, um, a teacher made me look in the mirror. And he made me look in the mirror, and he goes, what do you see? And uh, he goes, I'm not talking about your outside. What do you see? Look in your eyes. And I looked in my eyes, and I seen a lot of pain. You know, I'd seen, I just never noticed that. I'd seen a lot of pain. And, and that was what kind of put me deeper into my alcoholism. That's when I started drinking a lot. And you started again then. So you... Uh had a brief period of abstinence, <clears throat> and then you would have a beer here and there. She, uh, meanwhile, you started. I'm clever. See, I'm clever. The reason why I say that, because when they put me in a new house, I'm all by myself, now I can drink. See, I need to be around people so I won't drink. So I'm around people that I can't drink because they're going to know. I'm very clever. So when I get a chance to drink, I'm drinking. I haven't done nothing to, to stop drinking. I haven't done nothing. You know, I'm, I'm pretty, I'm miserable. I mean, like, but I'm helping everybody else. I'm too busy helping everybody else. And meanwhile, you're going to school. You got your mm -hmm. girlfriend a home. Uh, an apartment I got her an apartment for her and her son, but you're my still, son. You're still staying at the... At the sober living. And, and now you're drinking again. And I'm a counselor. Yeah. Now I'm a counselor slash sober living. I'm like doing everything. The kitchen, the driver, and they're getting more houses. And I'm looking over all the houses. I'm like burning out, but I don't know this. So I'm a workaholic. I like to, it's whatever addiction it is, I'm gonna do it, I'm gonna overdo it. I have a compulsive behavior. So now it comes to work, I, I constantly work. I'm working from like all the way up to like midnight and I get up at six in the morning and start again all day long, every day, every day. And once in a while I would take a day off and I go spend time with my, my girlfriend and my son. And this is funny because uh, she loves Disneyland. You know I hate Disneyland because it's like, it's too people. many people. So I would, I would, I got annual passes and, uh, oh my God, she wanted to go to Disneyland like three or four times a week with me. And I was like, no, you know what I mean? And it was like, I dreaded it. We would do sober dances. She was wanting to go to sober dances. I dreaded, I had anxiety. Did you explain this to her or did you just keep it all inside? Did I kept it all inside. Yeah. Yeah. I kept it all because inside. Because we don't want to disappoint, huh? Well, we don't want to show we're weak either. Well, we don't want to show we're weak, but yeah. we also, I think there's an element, I think you're a giver. I, I, I am know, a giver. I know you well. We've worked together. You're uh, my lead counselor at the uh, program. Uh, I, I think uh, we don't want to disappoint and we want to give, Correct. even at a cost to ourselves. Correct. Yeah. I am, I've always been a giver. Um, but something happened, Tim. Basically, uh, mind you, I don't really talk to my mom at all. I don't have, I mean, really talk to, I talk to her maybe once every like six months. At that time? Yeah, once every six months. I call her, she don't even call me. And I have a cell phone. Yeah, believe it or not, I got a cell phone. That's my only bill besides the apartment and everything else. 
Um, I am at the barber shop with one of my clients. She needed a haircut, so I took him to get a haircut. And uh, this is in 2011, around 2011. I get a phone call from my mother. She's never called me my whole life. My mom's never called me. Well, I mean, she's never called me. And uh, I answer the phone, and my mom's hysterically crying. I'm going like, what happened, Mom? What happened? And uh, she says, your brother, he was in Cosa Plaza Hospital in Norwalk. I go, what do you mean? And she goes, he overdosed. He uh, swallowed an uh, eight ball of methamphetamine and uh, got pulled over by the police. I hung up the phone and right away, um, I had my buddy Kenny, the one that got me the job, take me over there. Um, went over there and I, I went inside the hospital and uh, yeah, I seen him shaking and uh, Worst tragedy of my life, Dr. P. Um, see my brother. Mind you, you know, he went through a lot of stuff too. And uh, Younger brother. No, my oldest. My oldest brother, John, he went through a lot too. Uh, he was shaking and I, when I realized later on what it was, it was his nerves. Um, his um, then girlfriend took him to the hospital and left him on the floor in the parking lot. And they came out and got him. Um, they revived him. Um, but he was brain dead already. You know, um, I stayed there with him for a week. I held his hand tight. Please, John, I prayed. I prayed like I never prayed. You know what I mean? I prayed like I never prayed in my life. My mom was there with me, and for a brief moment, I felt like me and my mom were connecting due to that. You know what I mean? Um, you want to keep going? You want to take a minute break? It's up to you. No, I'm fine. I'm fine. Um, I'm okay with that today. I'm okay with that today. Um, but I held his hand for a week and my mom said I had to make the decision. She can't do it. So the doctor came to me and said legally he was dead. And so I had to have him pulled, his blood pulled. And I held his hand and uh, he said he'd probably live maybe five minutes once they pulled the plug. I, I felt his spirit leaving. I felt him leaving within like maybe 20 seconds because he tried. I mean, he was like, it was, I could just breathe him was just way off. Everything was way off. I just, he was, bodies got blown up, kidneys shut down, liver shut down, he had a stroke, everything on top. So I just let go. And uh, that was the worst tragedy in my whole life. Not even the prison time, none of that. Just losing my brother. Losing my brother was like, it was the hardest. Yeah, it was the hardest. And uh, that's when my drinking got into deeper. That's when I started drinking really heavy. Uh, I continued to drink a lot. Nobody knew. Um, you know, my then girlfriend, we eventually got married. We got married at that time, same time. And uh, my, uh, I, my, my girlfriend at the time said she realized that I didn't want to get married. Had nothing to do with her personally. Had to do with I was not happy. I was miserable still. It's interesting because 24 hours, it's been uh, at least five years since you got out now? Four Correct. Years? It's yeah. been four years, with, like four and a half years. So it seems like during your whole uh, prison stint, substance abuse and mental health was never addressed with you. Mm -hmm. You get out, and within 24 hours, you go to a safe place to cope. And that had an intermittent course of escalating and uh, calming down, dampening effect over time. But during this whole time, not only have you not received any substance abuse treatment, you've also not, well, for a little bit of time while, while you were not, well, that, never mind, that was a rehabilitation for reintegration into society. So no, you have not received any formal substance abuse treatment. You have not received any formal mental health, but even further, your substance abuse and mental health doesn't seem to even have been addressed or acknowledged by yourself or anybody around you. You're correct about that. It but hasn't I, even been touched. Yeah, and a lot of that is you. On, the, on this, uh, there's little, because you just, you're such a good, you can hide. Mm -hmm. You're hiding it. Well, it's also to, it's like not only hide it, but you have to be willing to want to work. Right, so you, you, I was, you weren't there. I was guarded. I was just not ready. I was not ready for it. I was not even close to ready. And meanwhile, you're actually reaching out and helping all of these other people, both as a manager of the whole program mm -hmm. that you were at, but you also have also become a substance abuse counselor. Correct. Pretty right. fascinating. Yeah. And um, 
I enjoyed it. I really did enjoy it. I enjoyed helping other people before I helped myself. And let's go back to when we talked about he made me look in the mirror. I, that's when it came to a realization, how am I going to help people when I can't even help myself? That's when it dawned on me. And, uh, and then another friend of mine that you know, that was my teacher there, her and another friend of mine made me go to lunch with them, which was unusual. They never take somebody, one of their students to lunch. And they asked me, they sat right in front of me and they go, you know, we really care about you, Dave. You know, you're an awesome person. You're going to be great in this field. We just want to know if you've been, if you, is there anything you want to tell us? I'm going in there smelling like alcohol, Dr. B. I mean, come on. How, you know, I guess I thought they were stupid or something. They're not. I, the alcohol was reeking out of my body. And uh, I was like, nah. I looked at them, nah. nah everything's fine. Nah. I had a hangover from the night before. And uh, I just went along with that. But that stuck in my head a lot. Like, man, people are catching on to me. I'm an alcoholic. Of course they're catching on to me. The alcohol is coming out of my pores. It smells nasty. Uh, I'm still working at the same place. Um, my alcoholism got out of hand. Um, I did some things that um, I'm not grateful for. Um, I did to my wife. Uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm not grateful for. Uh, I committed uh, adultery and uh, I left my wife. I left her for another girl. And uh, my wife suffered at the time with her own mental illness and she'd suffered the whole time. Um, but she was going through her own struggles. I felt like she didn't love me, Dr. B. Remember, I haven't addressed none of my issues. I still have my insecurities. So at that same time, her mom and me gotten really close. Um, her name was Oma. She was a beautiful lady. Um, we did a lot of things. Was, we could go on and on about that. You know, every time I went over, this lady made me crepes and stuff, and I felt special. Uh, but I had left my wife at the time, and I moved to Orange County, and I was living at a girl's house for a few months. Um, Oma, I get a call from my wife at the time, Ravena, and she uh, calls me. She tells me Oma's in the hospital. She had a stroke. This is her mother. Yeah, this is her mom. So I went to the, um, I told the girl, I'm, I'm going to take off. I'm going to go see she had a stroke, and I get over there, and... Uh, the whole family's like, this is it. She's pretty much, she, her stroke was pretty heavy. It was pretty heavy. And my wife was the one that was like, no, I'm not pulling the plug. I'm not. And uh, she knew I'd been drinking. And uh, I went a couple nights in a row, you know, to visit Oma. It was almost like my own mother. And on the third night, my wife was like, hey, I made some enchiladas. And mind you, she rarely ever cooked. So she made some enchiladas. Man, I'm gonna eat. Um, so she goes, yeah, come to, her, come to our house. At that time, we just bought, we moved to Carson. We got rid of the apartment, and that's something I forgot to say. I was really resentful towards her because I'm the one that got that apartment, and she gave up the apartment to move in to the Bovum house and with her mom. Didn't ask me. I felt like she, that hurt my feelings. She didn't ask me. Um, that's when my drinking kept getting harder. But, you know, she invited me to the, the Mobile House, um, where we lived, a beautiful home, by the way. Uh, she's feeding me, and, and she brings out some beer. I'm like, oh, we're going to drink. So I'm drinking, get, get hammered. At the end of the day, I wake up the next morning, I got hickeys all over my neck. Um, she takes pictures, sends it to the girl. So I came back home. Smart lady. Chess player. We laugh about it today. She's a chess player. She won. Um, but it had nothing to do with her as far as like with me cheating. Yeah. Had to do with my upbringing, what I saw, um, my self-esteem. Um, now there's the time I'm starting to use methamphetamines. So now, well, you, about what year is this? This is uh, like around 2013. 13, yeah. And so you finished school, <clears throat> mm -hmm. got married. Um, uh, uh, still living at the place. Oh, you're still living at the yeah, place? Yeah, when I left, when I left um, that girl's house, I left Candace, I got back to my wife. I still lived at the place because I had to live there. They wanted me to live there. I didn't have the courage to set boundaries saying, nope, I'm not going to live here no more. I'm going to live at home. See what I mean? Where did the meth come in at 2013? The meth came in when I came to visit uh, my girlfriend's house, where she, my wife's house where she lived, and uh, my nephew, he was been a meth user the last past five years, four years, 
And I told him, hey, um, I'm drunk, Dr. B. I'm really hammered. And I tell um, Daniel, I'm like, hey, Daniel, where do you get some meth? And he goes, well, Uncle Dave, you don't do meth. I haven't been doing it for the last three months. I lied to him. So he went and got me some. Lit it up after that. I lit it up. Because at that time, my drinking was really horrible. I'm having DTs. I'm seeing things. It's just bad. Depression's kicked in again. The meth took all that away. Thank God. Alcohol was way, the, the depression was just, it was dark. So I started doing meth, and I'm working at the treatment center. I'm working at the treatment center, and I'm snorting it for maybe two days. I start going back to IV. I start slamming again. I start slamming the methamphetamines again. I'm picking up maybe an eight ball a week, and nobody knows. I think they don't know. Uh, I do this for like maybe about a year. And uh, in 2013, um, I keep getting high. I, and my uh, wife came to visit me at my sober living where I worked at. And it was a separate house. And she came into my bathroom and she said she broke her heart. She's seen blood everywhere. That's from slamming meth. And, uh, but it all came to an end one day with Fred Brown's when uh, I fell asleep and I was supposed to be at work at 7. I woke up at 2 p.m. I showed up every day, no matter what. I would stay up for weeks or whatever. I showed up one day and my boss was like, what's going on with you? Make story short, I just eventually, I, I quit the job. I quit the job and uh, my addiction was pretty heavy. Um, my wife, Ravina, said, just come home. You know, and uh, I did come home and her mom was still in hospice at the time. She got her mom home and she's taking care of my mom, I mean her mom. And to me, that was impressive because she did it 24-7 herself. I'm at the house. I'm still slamming dope. I'm still doing dope. And uh, it's just horrible. Uh, her mom's still alive. Um, it's, just, it's just a nightmare. Uh, one day, you know, when she figured out that I was using methamphetamine, as I was sitting in my car, and it was like 4 in the morning. And she approached me like a couple hours later, and she says, are you doing meth? And I said, yeah. She cried cried because uh, I've come a long ways but she just didn't know that I was using meth um, she knew about the drinking she knew about the drinking um, she even started drinking with me later on but it used to make me mad because she would like get a glass of wine drink half of it and put it down I'm like what's wrong with this girl I drink a bottle no problem you know that's my thinking my using got to a point where she knew I was already using but it got to a point where one day I'm in the bathroom. She didn't like me getting high in the bathroom. I'm in the bathroom, in our bedroom, in the bathroom. I got holes all over me. I mean, it's horrible. I, I got scars still from it. I got holes everywhere. And I'm getting frustrated because I can't get it. And all I heard was come in and goes, you want me to help you? It broke my heart. That was my, that was my bottom. Uh, the reason why I said it was my bottom, the next day is when I reached out to Deborah. And, uh, and I knew I was done. My wife went around everywhere to her family, gathered up as much money to get me in detox, whatever she could do to get me in detox. And wow, she, that's, yeah, that's yeah. courageous. It is. I've never <clears throat> had that in my life. And she checked, got me into a detox rock center um, behind what Deborah said. Um, and then uh, basically uh, got into detox. I stayed there for 12 days because it was pretty bad. Um, checked into a real treatment center. And what I mean by real treatment center is the difference with free indigent programs that you go to compared to private insurance, there's a lot more for you. I think that's sad. When you go to indigent, they don't have therapy. They don't have none of that. They don't offer doctors for medication. They don't have none of that. None. And I, I, that's where I, I kind of like my prejudice came in. I went to the Surf City and it was like a three-story house, beautiful in Huntington Beach and uh, Guys are coming down on their surfboards, and uh, but I was dying. These are young kids, they're teenagers. Like to me, they're like teenagers. And I checked in. I was really tore up the floor up, and uh, checked into the place. And people are cooking steaks and stuff. I'm like, whoa! I go to groups for like three hours a day only. You know, I'm used to when I was at Fred Brown's, you do groups like eight to ten hours a day. Well, this place you only did groups three hours a day, but it was it was really like a small place. And I had to see a therapist once a week. And I got to a lot of my truth. I, you know, when I got there, I started to really do some work on myself. I got me a sponsor. I started being honest about everything. I, uh, 
everything I started doing, I was being honest now. I started talking about my core issues with my therapy. Therapy really changed my life. Uh, I had some great groups. I had a great teacher that was my, my, my counselor, who, who was Deborah. She did the groups and it was awesome. We had a great intimate group and I started to notice I still feeling good about myself. I got involved also with uh, another client there. It was an ex-cop from Jersey. Mm -hmm. Me and we hated each other at first. Well, we became best friends after that because convicts and cops think the same. They have yeah. the same type of thinking. In fact, studies show that. <clears throat> well, we had a lot in common. So he was like a, a brother to me. And uh, we did CrossFit together in uh, I won first place in Huntington Beach for CrossFit. I lost the most weight, body mass. Wow. Yeah, I was really proud of myself. And how long were you in treatment? I was in treatment for seven months. Wow. Yeah. And you had a relationship with your wife and the kids? We were doing, time? at the time it was strain. Mm -hmm. She was there for me 100%, but she told me, she says, I need you to work on you. And I never had that in my life. Someone said, work on you. She's very sober-minded and very committed to a long-term thing, whatever gets thrown at you guys. That's impressive nowadays. Yeah. She's tolerated with a lot of my crap. You know, a normal woman wouldn't put up with that kind of crap. I think she saw in me what I didn't see in me. You know, um, she's my best friend. You know, that's the bottom line. I just, I'm, I'm super grateful for her. Um, we have a funny relationship today, but I'll tell you a little bit more about that. It's, it's a good thing. Um, she's taught me how to laugh, because I didn't know how to laugh when I come out of prison. Everything's too serious. Uh, and I learned how to laugh. And you know, you and I laugh all the time yeah. at work. Yeah. You crack me up all the time. You're a great personality. So I'm over there, you know, doing treatment. I've worked on a lot of therapy. Now we're doing marriage counseling, me and my wife. And my therapist tells my wife, you know, we're doing a lot of good stuff. And she tells my wife, tell your mom you're going to be okay. Tell your mom you're okay. And uh, three days later when I was at the house, she told her mom, mom, you're okay. You can go. I'm okay. David's going to take care of me. Mom passed away after like a year and a couple months. Wow. Yeah, she let go. And uh, my wife struggled after that. She had a hard time because I was her rock, her mom. Um, the lady, Deborah, made me go home. She says, you're not staying in sober living like you did it for Browns for so long. It's time for you to go home. Stop being institutionalized. You know what I mean? For all these years. Yeah, all these years. I, I went home and it was boring. But that's what life's supposed to be. It was quiet. It was some chaos. You know, it was like I had my living room. I had a German shepherd. I had my son, my wife. It was peaceful. It's nice. Um, you know, it's interesting. <clears throat> you know, like life is boring. There's no chaos. Mm -hmm. And when we come up in that chaos, uh, that becomes the norm, right? Correct. And I, I don't, and you know, it actually starts pre-birth. And... Uh, for whatever reason someone falls in that situation, there's just so much hormonal influence in the body that just actually ha has a lot to do with your brain fundamental structure and how you come up and how you perceive the world. Mm -hmm. And yours started from way back when. Right. Oh, and, it was a t right? toddler. <laughs> and here we are about 40 years later, mm. just learning for the first time it was, it's it's tough, but it's doable. It's, it's very doable. It's commendable, and it's 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 amazing. I just want to point out the power of that. One, yes, there's a lot of tragedy in this, and like I said, I, I find the world to be a tragic place, but there's a lot of redemption, okay? Mm. So uh, out of all of that that I said, you know, you're at home now. You're telling me it's the first time that it's quiet. You're used to the chaos, a lifetime of chaos. We come up that way, and I, I you know, I like is saying by St. Augustine, and he, uh, he says something to the effect of, hope has two beautiful daughters, anger and courage. And a guy by the name of Chris Hedges uh, quotes this and oftentimes says something to the effect of, anger at the way things are, mm -hmm. courage to be able to attempt to change them. And you have faced unsurmountable odds, events, things thrown at you. You can almost say you're hardwired to fail. Correct. And yet there's this courage, and and this is interesting. It goes into the concept of 
faith and uh, you know and the cons and certain traditions of uh, Christianity you know the concept of faith it's you're not trying to succeed you're trying to do the right thing because it's the right thing to do correct so if you march yourself if I can use this analogy sort of if you march yourself into battle knowing that you're not going to win but you're still going to march into that battle mm -hmm. whatever it is if it's a war with yourself if it's a war with the society, if it's the war against somebody doing something wrong, whatever that is, and you are not the powerful in that fight, you expect to lose, and that's where courage comes in. And in some ways, whether you realize it, whether it's my uh, interpretation of the events imposing it on you, it still doesn't make it any less true. You are angry at the way things were, and you had the courage against unsurmountable odds to change. I, I like what you said, and you know, at the end of the day, what it came down to, Dr. B. I talked about love. it was never comfortable in my own skin. It was a war within myself. Um, I couldn't live this way no more. You know, it was, I was never at peace within myself. I did a lot of work on myself. You know, I, I, I worked on a lot of my insecurities, a lot of self-esteem. I did the steps for the first time. I, um, communication skills, um, I bonded friends with guys in treatment, um, my good buddies I still talk to today, Mike, um, John, John Kane in Jersey, people I still talk to today, I never knew how to bond with people in general, you know, um, these guys became real close with me, but not only that, but I was okay with me, David, and I was comfortable in my own skin for the first time in my life. I remember sitting at a place called Thousand Steps, and I remember sitting at the the, the beach. And, yeah, I remember this story. Yeah, and uh, this is why you were on treatment. Correct. And uh, I remember the owner coming up to me and goes, "Aren't you going to jump in the water?" And uh, I looked at him and I smiled and I go, "No, I'm okay." I sat by myself and for the first time in my life, I knew my life was going to be okay. It wasn't that big of a deal. <clears throat> From that moment on. Something to talk about hope. I knew there was hope. I'd seen hope for the first time. I'd seen the light at the end of the tunnel. I knew there was more for me in life. I knew I had a purpose. So I never knew I had a purpose. And I knew I had a purpose. And my purpose was to, um, to take care of my family, um, to help other individuals out. But not only that, continue to work on me. See, I can't blame society for everything. There's a part of me that has to... Um, take the initiative to, to improve my life every day, me as an individual. So I'm in treatment, why not every day, there's no excuse, why not work on myself every day? And I have to work on myself every day for the rest of my life. And you tell me that every day. Correct. And you tell me that every day. Even normal human beings need to find ways Absolutely. to, you know, and you know, society is so busy, you know, judging everybody else. Well, I need to focus on me. Stop looking at everybody else and just continue to grow spiritually. You know, and spiritually for me is, is something within inside of me. Um, just like I caught you vaping in the hallway. Um, those are things, it's, it's, it's odd because it used to be so hard to do right, so easy to do wrong. Well, it's, it's, it's reversed today. It's so hard to do wrong, it's so easy to do right. You talked about rewiring, I did a lot of rewiring. I think different, you know, I, the people I surround myself, including you, is a positive influence in my life. I need to be around winners. I need to be around people that, that think positive things in my life. And, uh, you know, you go through struggles. You, these last, you know, five years, I've, I've gone through some struggles, but I don't drink and use over it. I'm getting ready to go on five years sobriety. Congratulations. It means a lot to me. You know what I mean? I'm not going up getting a bogus chip. Um, you know, everybody has problems. You talked about that on the last... Uh, you know, nobody's comfortable in their skin. Well, I'm comfortable in my skin, but everybody has problems. We work through those problems. I don't run from them no more. Um, I'm into solution. I call people today. I call you all the time. I call people all the time. Um, my marriage, I look for ways to improve in my marriage because I'm not the greatest guy. Um, I'm also improving on being a better father to my son. Um, it's just important for me to be a better human being every day. Because it's that easy to slip and go back. Um, but I do appreciate my life today. At the age of 43 is when I knew I feel like I was a human being. And uh, I haven't had to look back at it. Um, I work with a lot of people today, and I enjoy what I do. I really do enjoy what I do. You know, I, uh, 
Uh, I, I appreciate that. And, you know, every day, I remember <clears throat> 35 years ago reading a Norman Mailer novel, and he had a, actually, uh, he, he said something about smoking. Uh, I don't remember it exactly, but it left an impression on my mind. And uh, the, uh, the, anta the antagonist in the novel wakes up in the morning and, and says, I'm getting up today and I'm going to quit smoking. And I've been doing that every day for the last 25 years. Something to that effect. But th that's the impression at least it left in my mind. And we both know, I think, every day you wake up and all you can do is try again. Mm -hmm. And that's where the courage is. And today, you know, I'm going to fast forward a little bit. You do amazing work. Uh, you are uh, uh, the lead uh, drug and al alcohol counselor at a place where we both, at the nonprofit mm -hmm. we're both at. Uh, we work very hard. I see you toil for our clients mm -hmm. and really get them to a special place and build special bonds with them. And at the same time, every day we deal with every single little thing that's thrown at us, whether it's financially as an institution, uh, clinically with the clients that we deal with, and our own personal lives. And it's important, I think, for everyone to realize that this is against the back drop of what, as I referred to earlier, is a hopeless situation, yet there is triumph in this story. I would like this to be translated into all of our social milieu, and uh, uh, will I ever win? Will we ever win? I don't know, but every day that we're alive, we try, mm -hmm. and I hope that someday we can go gently into that good night and look back and think, you know what? I did the right thing. We did the right thing. And, uh, and I can be an example to my son, to my daughter, to my wife, to my patients, to my clients. That doesn't mean that we don't fail. We fail right. also every day. But we just get up and keep moving forward and trying to do the right thing. Um, is there anything you want to add uh, to any of this, David? So yes, uh, you know, if any, uh, just so everyone knows, uh, that's what David does. He is our lead drug and alcohol counselor uh, at the nonprofit we're both affiliated with. And I see triumph, glory, and victory every day. Uh, and to take back, to look at it in the backdrop of his whole life and what he's come to, and he did it all by himself, really, with little sprinkles of reaching out to people and them lending a hand, which we all need. I like what you said there. You know, I, I didn't really like to think I did it all myself by myself, but I did reach out to people. That's what was really important. Um, you know, if any of you guys are watching, you know, if you're tired of being in pain and you're suffering, um, and you have unresolved trauma from childhood, adulthood, whatever it is, and um, stop going against the grain. You know, if you if you want a life a life that's beautiful. Um, St you know, stop going against the grain and, and start trusting people because I, I understand I never trusted people, but you got to start trusting somebody. And if you want to have a, a you want to have, you know, a decent life and where you can be okay with yourself, reach out to somebody. And uh, I promise you, um, people like me can make a difference in your life. Um, it's very important that I, I understand what you're going through. Um, you know, you get to live life for once where you're, you're, you're happy in your own skin. You go to sleep like nothing. You wake up like nothing. I mean, everything's not perfection. It's just progress with imperfection. Um, it's a beautiful thing. Um, so if, if you're tired of living that way, reach out to someone. Um, you can make a whole change and stop going against the grain. That's the bottom line. I, everything I do today is contrary to action. I do things I don't want to do, and uh, it's better for me. It's healthier better decisions and it just makes a difference in my life. That's such an important point, Dave, also, if I, I can, one last thing before closing, delayed gratification, okay? Things of value, it's not the materialistic mm -mm. society that we're living in. You're not looking for short-term gain, it's human relationships, Correct. okay? It's bonding with individuals. And, uh, and that's what Dave's done. After so many years down, after so many years in isolation, Social isolation, physical isolation, mental isolation. Uh, we work at that every day now. And uh, I'm really proud of you. 
Uh, I don't know how to thank you enough for joining me on this, uh, letting us join you on your journey here for the last couple of hours doing all of this. Uh, I hope we can do some more shows together in the future. Uh, it Sounds was, good. It was fantastic. And we're going to continue this journey together, and we're going to update the viewers as we go along. Um, I want to thank everybody for joining us on this. Um, this is a long journey. And we want to be there for you, and we want to continue this kind of uh, programming for you. So I want to thank you all. And please su subscribe to our channel below and click on the bell. We'd really appreciate that. The more subscribers we have, the more followers we have, we can do much more uh, contents for you that you enjoy. And please, in the comments below, please tell us what you want to hear about. If you have any questions, let us know. We're here for you. This is a nonprofit organization, and we're trying to bring you programming that's beneficial and helpful to your, towards your recovery, your mental health, and your future. Mm. If you haven't seen Dave's part one and part two of this long, beautiful, wonderful journey that he shared with us, please click over here to my left.